welcome. I know it's the last but one session on the last day, and uh, it's already been packed. But um, I'm hoping maybe your gears energized you and you want to learn something more about cameras. So welcome, everybody. My name is Balwinder Kaur, and I'll be talking about uh, the Camera 2 APIs today um, that was released with Android Lollipop. So this summer, my teenage son went to a Shifology camp. It's just a fancy way of saying cooking class, but he came back super energized and passionate. Okay, so he came up super energized, passionate about cooking, and he was, I was informed that the tools in my kitchen are quite primitive, uh, very respectfully like teenagers talk, rolling their eyes and showing a lot of attitude. And I figured, this looks pretty good to me. I've been using it for years. I have the small knife, which does most of my work, the big knife for things like watermelons, and a peeler for uh, um, apples and potatoes. But he insisted on educating me about paring knife, steak knife, a, a um, boning knife, a bread knife, a slicing knife. And he wanted me to get something like this. Now let's say, even if I did put down $3,000 for a knife set like this, what would I do with it, right? Some, I would have to go and learn what the difference is between slicing and dicing and mincing and julienning. So welcome to Camera 2 APIs. It's really a power tool for cameras. Gone are the days when we had the APIs that very much mimicked point-and-shoot cameras. And this is on some sort of a roll by itself. Okay. So with Android Lollipop, the old APIs are deprecated, and we have um, new APIs, which are basically power tools for the camera. And they do exactly what that expensive knife set does, it really exposes a lot of things. There are a lot of power tools, but one really has to know photography. You need to know the image sensor. How does that work? Binning um, versus other mechanisms. What is a bear pattern? Do, what are black level locks? Noise reduction, hot pixels, image pipelines. You could do some of the easier use cases, sure, but then there is also a complete paradigm change. The way the camera devices are modeled has also changed. And so why did they really do this? This is my understanding. Um, there were limitations with the uh, previous camera API. So has anybody in the audience ever tried to build extensions, like an, is there an OEM here, try to extend the camera hal? Okay, so maybe you've experienced trying to add pan things like panoramic stitch or multi-frame um, HDR into it. I was doing it a couple of years back. And even though you have access to maybe the hardware that does these things for you, when you try to expose it up to the application developer, you run into all sorts of limitations. So it was a use case based model. Extending it was painful and typically the people who did end up adding different modes like best picture mode, um, HDR, panoramic stitch, they were more or less uh, either the OEMs doing it or OEM partners doing it. You find uh, camera applications on the Play Store with newer features, but they're much less. There was no per frame control, and people who are really into photography are very passionate about getting the raw sensor image. There was no support for that, even though the raw callback in the camera API has been there since API level one. I did not find even one device which would actually return anything but null in that. Very minimal metadata. So the one thing that we everybody got back was some face data, but that was it. Customization of the API. There was one pipe going down, which was the camera parameters, but those were strings, and that was about it. There was not really a channel or a pipe to send metadata back up. So what does this new Camera 2 API do? This is really born of the 
uh, Stanford a project which was called FCAM. A lot of those people went to Google. Uh, they went to other companies as well, but the person leading the camera framework team is from the original FCAM team. And it really enables newer experiences. It has the old point and click, but then it also has DSLR-like um, uh, functionality, so professional camera. Now, one of the things you might have noticed is what people do with DSLRs is, yes, yeah, some of them just take pictures and it has a nice lens. Um, you can have your settings and you store your JPEG, but a lot of them will also download raw onto their computers and do post-processing and adjust all the filters till they get the image just right. So professional camera plus post-processing on the device itself. As you're very well aware, the processing power on our little devices has grown 64 times in the last decade. So we have these um, quad-core uh, processors now. There's a lot of processing power available. And even before this API came out, I was actually quite surprised to find out that there are applications available on the App Store that will process raw for you, and the use case why they were built was because people didn't want to carry their laptops everywhere. They took the DSLR and they took a tablet so that they could use the app there. But that functionality already exists. Last one is what I've named the Innovative Mobile Camera Plus Plus, which is basically, with this new API, it's going to enable a lot of new use cases which our creative developer community is going to use and come up with some really killer applications. And so let's go into this a little bit in detail. Point and click, very simple. You have your live preview, you have your still capture and video recording. Professional camera, what that typically needs or is a requirement to be called a professional camera is fine-grained control of the hardware. There are three pieces of hardware in the camera. It's the lens, the sensor, and the flash. And also to be able to get the raw image sensor output, which with the capture data, what were the settings with which I actually captured this data? Next, we come to computational photography. So besides the individual frame control, it also, you also need algorithms, and you need the compute power to take those indiv individual frames and blend them into a better picture, a different picture. Some examples are HDR, focus stacking, exposure bracketing, and I will go over these uh, in a little bit. And finally, we have the innovative mobile cameras that I just talked about. It's pretty much, so is this, is this camera, Android hardware camera too, is it going to replace DSLRs? I don't think so. I really think it's a, going to be some overlap with the DSLR, but there are some things that the mobile camera can do with this version of API, but there are some things it won't be able to do. The very obvious one is the lenses and the optics that are available. So one of the things that professional cameras enable you to do is full resolution at full frame rate. So I'm not an imaging person by background. I'm, I have a software background, but I've been work, working at an imaging company for three years now, and everybody kept talking about full frame rate and full resolution, and that was such a subjective concept to me. So I had to stop and ask them, like, what do you mean by this? So it turns out, full resolution and full frame rate means whatever is the full resolution of your image sensor. If it's 5 megapixel, it means 5 megapixel. If it's 13 megapixel, it means 13 megapixel. And full frame rate is typically 30 FPS, but um, the spec mandates here 20 FPS for the class of cameras that they call full. So it's a little subjective, but people in the trade do understand what it means. Computational photographies. The other thing I found working at the imaging company was that people are really divided on the definition of computational photography. So I'm going to go with this definition. It really means you take a picture with a camera, and then you have different manipulation techniques with which you enhance the quality of the image you have just taken. That being said, let's take a look at some of the use cases which are commonly known in computational photography. So some of, the thing, some of these we have now grown very used to. Most of us have smart form, and we are now used to this fact that you can take an HDR picture or a panoramic picture. 
HDR. There are many different techniques for doing HDR, which really stands for high dynamic range. Multi-shot HDR means you take three successive frames at different exposures and you blend them together computationally. Now, one of the key things here is to make sure that when you're taking those three exposures, they happen in quick succession, because otherwise you're going to introduce a set of artifacts like blur motion, a car went by, a person moved, and then the final image does not meet image quality standards. This one, most of us know what that is, panoramic stitch. Thank you. In this case, each frame, it's again a set of frames. Each frame has orientation information, but these ones are taken at fixed exposure. You stitch them together, and you get your panoramic state um, photograph. Flash, no flash photography, I haven't seen it as commonly. So in the example here, which is a set of uh, images from Microsoft Research, is there is a traditional lamp. And if the picture is taken with the flash on, which is the second picture from the left, the, we lose the warm illuminance of the scene. We get all the detail, but we lose one aspect, which is very important for good image quality. When we take the picture without the flash, we get the illuminance of the scene, but of course it's noisy, we've lost detail, but guess what, when we combine them together, we get a much better picture. This is another example of flash, no flash photography. Focus stacking. So anytime you try to take a picture of an object which is really close to your camera, you can either typically get the front of the object in focus or the backside of the object or the part of the object that is farther away from the camera. But if you can set focus the way you want, and then blend them, then you get what is either called focus stacking or it's also called all in focus photography. Now we come to the slightly more interesting ones. So with Android L, there is a sample HDR viewfinder, which they even demoed, the camera team demoed at Google I.O. and the sample code is available. But in this case, so all the previous examples that we had, we had the uh, multi-shot HDR and the panoramic stitch. We are all very used to putting our cameras in that mode and then waiting for the post-processing. So even the blur feature, if any of you have used the Google um, Android uh, camera app, there's a blur feature, but that also requires post-processing. What if we could do all of this before we actually took the picture? So you have your live preview, you set, you compose your scene the way you want to. If you want a certain object it blurred, you want something sharpened, dull, you do all of that and the settings are now stored. And then when you take a picture, you've got it exactly as you. So pre-processing instead of post-processing. The other thing is mobile embedded vision applications. So while the API doesn't talk too much about this, um, I think it was a couple of years back, I was trying to integrate a gesture recognition a library uh, using ice cream sandwich it was maybe, and there was a lot of problem was because the devices did not provide a constant frame rate. And that is more important than the image quality for vision applications. So with all the different streams and all the APIs that get open, I'm thinking even this part uh, is going to get a boost. And this is our innovative mobile camera plus plus that I've been talking about. So besides the fine grained control, this device compared to the traditional DSLR has access to the cloud. It has access to the proximity. It has a bunch, a rich set of sensors. It knows your location. It knows your calendar. It knows your history. It knows where, what event is coming up next. So if you're going to go to your daughter's soccer game and it's raining outside, it would probably know that the camera application needs to be set, the flash needs to be probably on, it needs to be in the sports, it needs to be in a sports mode or a burst mode so that you can capture your perfect shot. Smarter than before. And so with this, um, let's move into the camera to 
architecture piece. So I have pulled off some of the diagrams from the source.android.com website, and they may not be as clear in resolution, so I'm going to try to talk through the diagram. So on your right-hand side, this is what the architecture diagram looks for, a, uh, for the old camera API. What is not really visible in this camera API is, uh, in this architecture is, that whenever settings were set for a request, if you want to take a picture and you set some certain settings, one, they were global settings. So if you've set them once, whatever requests are in the pipeline down to take a picture, all of them get impacted. The second thing was there was no guarantee. It wasn't deterministic. You didn't know when the settings would go in effect. Is, it going to, is there a one-frame delay or is there a four-frame delay? There was no way to know it. And when you actually started getting your frames back, what was the setting with which you got it back? So none of that is known in this model. This is the architecture of the new one. And so let's walk through the colors here. The, on the lower right side is a gray colored box which represents the camera hardware. And within that you'll see there are a bunch of requests in a queue. The green is the modeling of the system um, as viewed by the application. It's a pipeline model. Requests go in and uh, with different settings, but in this case if you look at the orange block on top, the settings for a certain request are now bundled with the request. So per frame, you can send a request. At the bottom, if you look, there is a gray colored box, which will send back not only uh, the result of the capture, but it also tells you with which settings it was actually taken. The, the blue boxes in the middle are interesting because they represent surfaces. The surfaces, these are target surfaces to which the camera, when you make a request, you will put in not only your settings, but you will say, okay, I please send the image data to all these target surfaces. This is the same uh, model as the previous one, but with a lot more detail. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this one. With this, uh, let's enter, let's start talking about the camera APIs. So what I decided to do was that instead of just talking about e uh, all the different classes and going through them, I'm going to take the live preview use case and walk through the API to say how it works, and then I'll talk a little bit how it needs to be modified if we're doing capture or burst capture or video recording. So uh, in case it's I'm, I'm sure most of you are aware that the Android hardware camera API is deprecated from up to 4.4 and 5 introduces, so all the classes and interfaces are deprecated and there's a brand new two packages are there, android.hardware.camera2 and camera2.pounds. So really everything that I'm going to be talking of is mostly from the first package up there. And this is the definition from the Java doc. So some of the things, um, that, need, that we need to be uh, careful of or we need to sort of grasp and understand the paradigm shift, it, it's a pipeline model. You send requests in, there are multiple requests. Once a capture is taken, one image data, you get image data and you get metadata. Metadata is returned back with the result and image data is sent directly to any of the target surfaces that you provided. But because um, per frame control is required, and to maintain full frame rate, there's always going to be multiple requests lined up in a queue. So before we actually start something, the first thing the application would need to do is figure out, well, gee, what's available? And so some of the things we're going to talk about is camera devices, streams. These are really output streams of the image data. A capture session. What are the target surfaces? Capture request and capture results. First thing, which we used to do even in the previous um, API, is find out how many cameras do I have. But there's no more concept of front-facing and rear-casing cameras. You just get a bunch of camera IDs back. Once you've got that, you get from the camera manager, you get 
characteristics, camera characteristics. So this is one of the three kinds of metadata that the system will provide you. This is the static metadata of the system, of the camera subsystem. It does not change. You don't even need to open your camera to get this set of metadata. Then there is the dynamic metadata, which depends upon the depends upon individual frames. Once you get uh, the camera device back, there are three cat classes of cameras that are now supported. There, we have legacy, limited, and full. Legacy basically means it has all the functionality that was, it just works like the traditional camera one or the original camera APIs. Limited and full are new. In addition to that, a camera could also support the capabilities of RAW, which basically means RAW sensor um, data. The next thing we need to determine is how many streams does the system support? Now, there are, again, here also there are three classes of streams. One is called process and non-stalling. Basically, it means it will maintain the full frame rate at full resolution. So think of YUV. It's processed and non-stalling. The other one is if you've requested a JPEG in your output stream, well, JPEG can have an additional delay between frames. So that's called the stall delay or stall time. Last, we have raw data. Now, what you can request, you can query the system to find out what is the maximum number of streams that the uh, system supports. What follows now is a series of Java doc. There is, so within the create capture session, there is this huge documentation about what, does, what are the what is the guarantee that the API provides in terms of the number of streams that it can support and in what combinations? So I'm going to quickly look at this one. The last line there is, let's say you wanted to do still capture, you wanted to do in-app processing, and you wanted to send a live preview to the display. So the first one, you can see what is the maximum for each type, what is the maximum size that you can get. So you'll get maximum, uh, the complete res maximum resolution for JPEG, and for all the others, it will be the preview size. And I will let you enjoy reading all this at your leisure. This is another example. Here you have RAW and JPEG both at maximum resolution, and you have YUV at preview resolution. But that's in the Java doc. How, do you, how does the application find out? So they have provided a class which is called Stream Configuration Map, and you can query it for supported process streams, stalling streams, what is the supported video sizes. You get the idea. This is really what the full camera devices have to support. So it's 30 frames per second per frame control. The blue box, manual sensor control and manual post-processing control. And I will try to get to those at the end. The other thing is they are supposed to, are supposed to uh, support minimum three processed non-stalling uh, non output streams. Limited and legacy. Legacy, I said, you can ignore. It's the old one. For limited, there's a lot of querying to happen within the application. Now that we sort of have an idea of what the landscape the camera landscape looks on the device, we need to start setting up. We need to open a device, and you get a handle to the camera device in a callback. This is important. So this is where actual buffers, the, um, uh, the actual buffers beneath the HAL get set up if the camera needs to be powered on it will get powered on. It is an expensive operation. So if you know that in this particular mode of your camera application, these are the certain streams and target uh, surfaces that I would need, you set them up one time with a capture session. The one thing to do here is you need to minimize your calls to create capture session. Try to reuse as much as possible, but if it turns out that, oh, that from the table that we saw earlier, a certain configuration is not supported, then you have to tear down and start a new camera session. What are the different target output streams that are supported? So for preview, 
the two classes that are typically supported are surface view and texture view. Still capture, there is a new class that was introduced, if I'm not mistaken, on 4.4, which is called the image reader. It has multiple format modes in it. Could go either JPEG or, J or RAW sensor. Video recording, both media recorder and the media codec is supported. And for in-app processing, there's render script, another format for image reader, surface texture, GL surface view. Now, once that we've opened the camera, we've set up, we have our session started, we actually create the capture request. There are some templates that are inbuilt, and for our use cases, we would just use that. So select your request template. The one at the bottom is manual, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Next is, what's your target output? It has to be one from the tar surfaces that you set when you created the create capture session call. And finally, you pick the frequency of the capture request. So if you notice, there's capture and capture burst, and there's set repeating requests. So preview is a repeating request. You always want your live preview on your display. The first two take priority over set repeating request and set repeating burst. I've not really understood what set repeating burst is, but I haven't still investigated it. So if any of you figured that out, do let me know. Once you pick the, picture, uh, pick the frequency, you're ready to go. Now it's all a matter of receiving your data. You can get it either, uh, the image data will come back typically through the uh, callback for the output surface, and metadata comes back through the uh, callback for the camera capture session. Now how do you associate them? They may not come back at the same time. Although the request will be processed in the same same order, but you don't know what time. So there's the time set stamp, and you need to synchronize using the time stamp. So for the uh, JPEG, so these are the other use cases. It's pretty much like preview what we did, except there are you pick the, uh, you pick the appropriate template, you pick the appropriate frequency, you pick the appropriate uh, image data that you want to support. So I'm going to go through these. OK, this one is interesting. This is the raw sensor data. There's one additional thing you'd need to do. So the format that is supported is raw sensor. It is um, not an open uh, format. It is whatever is private to that image sensor. So to use it in any of these applications that I mentioned earlier, you would have to convert it to the DNG, which is an Adobe format. It's called digital negative, and it's widely supported in a lot of tools. So there's a convenience class called DNG creator, and you would have to convert it to get your DNG file. Burst, so these are some of the pictures I took with the Nexus 5 um, uh, phone. And I actually have a few sample apps running on. If anybody's interested, later on I can demo it to you. Video recording, just a different set of parameters to choose. For in-app processing, it's really what you want to do. So we're already somewhat familiar with these in terms of we're very familiar, we're used to the filters. Everybody likes to put their filters before uploading a uh, picture to Instagram or Facebook. Everybody needs to look much nicer. Uh, custom post-processing of the imaging pipeline, and with that, I think I already covered this, that are, there is static metadata and there is dynamic metadata. And there are different classes. Uh, so once you open the Java doc and look at the API, there's just any number of fields for what kind of metadata can be. You can query for it and it'll get returned. So have fun with that. Now we come to fine-grained control. I like to call it the devil. <laughs> Manual sensor control. So you can set the sensitivity of the sensor. You can set the exposure time. You can also set the frame duration. For flash, if flash is present, you can set that. Lens, you can set your lens, your focal length. And if you want to set a black level lock. This is actually, I didn't really know how to 
title this slide, Manual 3A Control, when 3A is the auto algorithm control, so the three co are auto exposure, auto focus, and auto white balance. And um, this lets you override the auto algorithms that are part of the system. So the way you can override those settings are, there is an overall switch. If you put that to off, then the entire pipeline is in the application processor's control. The other way to do it would be if you're just interested in controlling, if let's say you have a better auto white balance algorithm and you want to plug that in and make that your differentiator, then you can leave the control mode at auto, but the individual control can be set to off. And then there is a list of all the different parameters through which you will be able to override the algorithm. With this, we can move into manual post-processing. So that's another diagram on the left from source.android.com, and I just blew up the image processing pipeline. So image processing pipelines are, um, is the IP of most of the companies that provide that functionality. So this is just a sample or um, a reflective image processing pipeline. These are some of the different things that you can change while, so once you get your YUV data or you get your raw data, you can um, make changes based on these uh, parameters. This is some of the parameters that are mandated that will, that must be supported by a full device, but uh, a vendor could provide additional controls as well. So I briefly just talk about, this is one slide about the camera two dot parameters class. It's really, a, uh, so the stream configuration map I already talked about and face is the face data that used to be there in the previous APIs. All the others are really convenience methods to um, manage for the post-processing of the image pipeline. Play store feature filters. So one of the things that actually just got released, uh, I think maybe last week, was uh, uh, filters that you can put in the Play Store. If your application is requiring a certain feature, then you can specify it. And you can specify if you need a full device, if you need additional raw capability, if you're going to need manual sensor or post-processing uh, uh, capabilities. And there's a link at the bottom if you want to read more detail about how it's going to work. So the one thing that I would like to say is that just because you've got a device which says it's running Android Lollipop doesn't mean that it has the full camera API. Because the CTS tests, they will certify you as a legacy device. So that's one of the things just to be cautious of. And it's all about you and your power tools. That's all I have in for the slide deck. Oh, and we have 15 minutes left, so I'm ready to take questions if there are any. Sure, I believe we're supposed to use the mics for the it's being, session is being recorded. So there is a DNG creator. Uh, are there any tools to read back the DNG and parse the metadata in it? Uh, say that again, please, sir. I didn't understand. There is DNG creator for saving Correct. raw files. Are there any tools available in the API to read it back and parse the metadata? So uh, you're saying that if there's a DNG, you have a DNG file, if there's a way to read the metadata out of it? Right. So I did not look at that, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It would need some investigation. No other questions? We just need to get out of here and go home. Yes, well, okay. Thank you, and if any of you want to see the demo, I have it up here. Thanks, thank you all.